As he dove deeper into that underwater cave, he soon realized that they'd struck it rich. The lake bed glistened with the shimmer of copper ore. But the real surprise happened when the light from the cave's entry started to go dark, and he began to notice that same eerie green glow he encountered the night before. But before we begin, if you love cryptids and want to learn the full story, both the legends and the facts delivered as a narrative story, then this guided tour is for you. Dive on over and tap that subscribe, like, or review button, depending on where you watch or listen. Now, fasten your diving helmet and get ready. The tour is about to start. I'm Cody. And I'm Elaine. And you're touring cryptids, cryptids across, across the, the Atlas. Atlas. Lake Superior, a body of water so massive that it borders Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Ontario, Canada. By surface area, Superior is the largest lake in the entire world, spanning a massive 31,700 square miles and contains one-tenth of all freshwater there is. And while Lake Superior is home to its fair share of fishermen, water sports enthusiasts, and beachgoers, if the stories are true, it's also home to a multitude of cryptid encounters along its shoreline and into the depths of its 1,300 foot deep trenches. So let's weigh anchor and set sail into the wild and monstrous tales of Lake Superior. It mesmerized him, but to be honest, he couldn't quite understand what he was seeing. A group of copper mining prospectors had made journey out into Lake Superior and set up camp on one of its many islands. They'd spent the day analyzing the surrounding areas and here at this particular island, things seemed promising. So as evening drew in, they opted to skip the long return trip back to base camp and crash here on the beach in hopes of getting an early start to their underwater expeditions. As evening turned to night, the damp wind licked across the massive lake, leaving their fire weak and in constant need of tending. So when one of the men got up from his makeshift pallet to go grab some more wood to keep it going, he saw something otherworldly in the waters ahead. Entranced, he called out to the other prospectors to come and take a look. As they made their way closer to the shoreline, the green glow began to grow brighter. The aquatic luminescence began uncoiling in the waters, worming and folding over itself until it spread out to nearly 30 feet in length. That's when one of the men had a startling return of memory. He looked over at the crewman on his left and stated, Do you remember hearing the Native American tales of a creature that lives in this lake? The one that is said to pull hunters from the shoreline and capsize boats? What if this thing is none other than the Mishapishu? In hearing this, the prospectors snapped from their trance. One of the men grabbed his rifle and fired into the glowing water. Instantly, the green light faded and the night returned. Fearful of the idea that whatever this thing was might return, the prospectors took shifts the rest of the night, firearms in hand, watching the waters to ensure that the alleged beast didn't come back. And finally, as the sun began to just barely glisten across the water, everyone breathed a collective sigh of relief. Despite their long and fearful night, their plan to camp over and get an early start seemed to be working in their favor. But little did they know, their encounter with the green glowing beast had only just begun. The prospectors all climbed back aboard their boat and made the quick journey around from where they were camping to a cove where they had spotted promising signs of copper ore. They suited up their diver in the cumbersome canvas dive suit bolted down the breathing helmet, checked to ensure the breathing pump was functioning, and attached the speaking tube, which was a tube attached to the helmet and ran back up to the boat that in theory allowed for very basic communication. Once the green light was given, no pun intended, their diver grabbed his bucket and crowbar, fastened his utility knife to his belt and safety line, and stepped off the edge of the vessel where he then sunk 30 or so feet to the cove's floor. As the suit settled, it didn't take long to realize that they'd struck gold, or I mean copper, 
The lake floor was covered in a green tarnish that signaled this was the spot they'd been looking for. He followed the vein of copper along until he reached a large overhanging rock in what looked to be some kind of underwater cavern. He continued into the mouth of the cave, but quickly realized his hoses were pressing against the outcrop rock. He ran out of slack. So he turned to head back out of the cave and back to the boat, but just as he did, the light spilling in from the cave's entrance went dark. Quickly, the diver reached out his hands and began feeling his way along the rock walls. But as he progressed, the cave's walls seemed to shift. At first, the stones felt familiar under his thick canvas gloves, but now it was as if the walls began to sink as he pressed against them. He pressed harder to try and comprehend what he was feeling. But as he did, he noticed the wall begin to glow. A green light began to spill in around the cavern. Thoughts of the previous night came flooding back and the diver began to panic. He turned to try and hide deeper in the cave, but his lifeline and breathing tube were stretched to their limits. As panic took over, he began to yell into his diving helmet that he needed help, just hoping that his speaking tube would work like they had hoped. And his yells worked all right, except instead of alerting his fellow prospectors back up on the boat, he turned to find himself just inches from a giant, yellow, menacing eye. Just then, a bursting flash of green lit up the cave. The creature began to writhe and flail at the diver, but in a last-ditch effort, he had unclipped his knife and began slashing at the creature's advances. The more he cut and stabbed, the more angry the monster became, until finally it whipped around, grabbed the man by the waist, and lifted him from the lake floor. With his air hose now kinked under the creature's firm grip, time was drawing short. He took one more blind swing at his green glowing foe and severed the arm that held him completely off, causing the monster to shrink back in pain and slip back off into the dark depths of the cavern. The diver desperately pushed himself out of the cave's mouth, attempting to tug on his lifeline, but water was leaking into his helmet now. Black stars began to dance around him as he realized his oxygen line had been severed and he slipped out of consciousness. Minutes later, his eyes snapped open. Where was he? What had happened? He looked up to see, to see the sun. He was somehow back on their boat. As he sat up, looking around at the rest of his crew, he could see the look of terror on their faces. They told him how they had heard him yell from the speaking tube, and then the boat began to shift as if something had been pulling at his lines from below. As soon as they felt a bit of slack, they quickly began to pull him back to the surface. He then recounted back the harrowing tale of coming face to face with that green glowing monster they had seen the night before, showing them the still slightly crimson stained knife tied to his safety rope on his suit. The group of prospectors quickly turned and set sail away from that cursed island and back to their main camp, swearing to never tread the waters of Lake Superior again. On Thursday, August 26, 1886, the Manitowoc pilot published this daunting tale we just shared. And while I am sure many of us would love for this tale to be true, the reality is this is most likely just another case of yellow journalism. Yellow journalism was all too common in the late 1800s. You know the sort. Those articles that to us now are obviously over-exaggerated sensationalism conjured up to spike sales on slow news weeks. It was a common tactic in the days when news wasn't so fast-paced and getting information wasn't as easy as tapping a piece of pocket glass. And while this form of sensational storytelling is still quite common today, though often laced with slightly more believable lies from more reputable sources, in the late 18 and early 1900s, yellow journalism was literally the norm. I can't help but think back to our first episode, where we discussed the Alkali Lake Monster in Nebraska and the many theatrical stunts the local paper's chief influencer at the time, John G. Mayer, pulled to sell a few papers and ended up creating an international news sensation. So as you can see, yellow journalism is powerful. Storytelling is how humans communicate. And the more elaborate the story, the more the story takes hold. But just because this one story has yellow roots doesn't mean Lake Superior's water doesn't have its share of mysteries. Because if the legends are true, 
Our probably fictional divers from our story were right to fear the lake, and they should be thankful that the creature they encountered wasn't the monster that is said to have called Superior its home for thousands of years. He stood watching as they cast out their nets, but he never expected to see this. Father Paul Le Lejeune, a French missionary to the Ojibwe First Nation peoples in the Lake Superior region, had grown to love spending time with these local natives, even going so far as to learn their languages to better understand those he sought to share the gospel with. But as he curiously watched from the shore, he noticed the natives fish out something rather peculiar. The fish looked to be over a meter and a half or about five feet long, with a strange lizard-like body and with the head of a turtle. Father Paul watched curiously as the men quickly cut the creature free and hastily released it back into the water. Later that evening, Father Paul inquired as to what the fish was, but the Ojibwe quickly corrected him. That was no fish. No, that was a monster, a creature so powerful it could conjure storms large enough to wipe out entire villages. We regret catching such a fiend and only hope that by releasing it, the Mishupeshu will spare us its wrath. The Mishupeshu, or Great Lynx, is a creature the Ojibwe people have told of for hundreds, if not thousands of years. This powerful aquatic creature is often revered as a symbol of Lake Superior's power. Traveling along the lake's underwater tunnels, the natives claim the Mishupeshu can summon ferocious storms, massive waves, and consuming whirlpools. With the body of a reptile, the head of a cat, and the horns of a bison, the Mishupeshu is no creature you would want to offend. But how would one offend a water panther with mythological powers? Well, by taking the one thing it loves most. See, Lake Superior is home to an abundance of copper, and this copper holds a very sacred significance. When the Ojibwe people arrived here in the 1500s, there were already dozens of ancient copper mines dating by some estimates all the way back to 2500 BC. These copper veins represent heritage and history, both things the Ojibwe value greatly. It was not uncommon to find chunks of polished copper handed down for generations as a sort of totem or a charm symbolizing strength. And as long as there has been people mining these copper mines, there have been tales of massive, aquatic, dragon-like cats with glistening copper horns protecting it. You can even see evidence of this for yourself at Agava Rock, a sacred lakeside site located in the Lake Superior Provincial Park in Canada. There, resting at eye level, carved into the face of a massive 15-story tall granite cliff, rests the depiction of a monstrous creature with a scaly back, feline head, and powerful horns like that of a bison. If you're a regular of our tour here, or an active lover of anthropology, then you probably already figured out that the Mishapishu is not just a powerful water dragon cat, but rather a guardian symbol of this most sacred commodity. That's why tales of this creature snatching people off the shorelines who dared pocket too much of this precious resource are common tales in the Ojibwe nation. And luckily, over time, the Ojibwe people developed ways to appease the Mishapishu. Small offerings of tobacco and other goods seem to satisfy the beast enough to allow for safe passage. On rare occasion, the Mishapishu would even find itself in a good mood, offering medicine, protection, or a good day of fishing to the occasional local. But by and large, the Mishapishu is, well, a troublemaker. Often bored just chilling under the water living its best life, the Mishapishu has been known to step out of line, casting judgment for the most simple of things. Playing the archaic role of the trickster god, Mishapishu has been known to strike for no other reason than to satisfy its chronic boredom. Take the story of a group of friends out enjoying a day on their yacht in 1897. While they were out cruising along the lake, one of the gentlemen on board slipped when their vessel struck an unusual wave. He fell backwards and tumbled over the rail, splashing into the water below. Just then, a massive serpentine creature with the head of a cat came bounding out of the depths, wrapped around the man, and squeezed the air from his body until his eyes began to bulge. 
The other passengers begin to yell and toss things at the mischievous Mishapishu until it finally released the man and splashed away. Tales of the Mishapishu drowning children who were left unattended by the waterside have often been passed down. In the Churchill River area, it's not uncommon to find modern children playing a game of Mishapishu based on this creature's morbid habit. One child plays the role of the monster attempting to toss all their friends into the water. When you manage to soak all the other kids, you win. Monster tales have a way of springing up wherever tragedy falls. As we stated before, stories are the way humans communicate best. Trying to explain landslides? Maybe it's a slide rock bolter. Why did the bridge collapse? Could it have been the Mothman? Why does my friend suffer from depression? Probably walking Sam. Why did that shipwreck or that child drown? Must have been a Mishapishu. We use stories to convey messages. We put faces to feelings and shapes to tragedy. But these stories often teach us beautiful lessons about the value of community, how to be more wise with our commodities, and how to better respect our fellow humans. Really, I feel we could all learn a thing or five about how to be better stewards of our time, resources, money, and relationships if we would make it a point to take these stories in and really chew on their meanings. But aside from the parabolic assimilation we place between these stories and real life, often these stories have roots in things a bit more tangible. Sometimes tragedy happens and we use the unexplainable to explain it, but what about when the unexplainable seems to be the only explainable answer? It's one thing to write fantastical stories about giant squids or speak of water panthers, but what about when it's not a story? What about when your eyes can't explain what you're seeing? Monsters may make great stories, but what if the stories were true? Some say it's just a natural evolution of the story, but others swear it's true. For the last few hundred years, people have told accounts of something outside of their comprehension slinking about in this ocean-sized lake. Serpentine in stature and with a large, abnormally cat or horse-like head, many could see how the lake superior monster seems like a modern telling of that aquatic sphinx. But aside from the scales and head shape, that's where the similarities seem to end. Pressy, as the creature has been dubbed, partly for its serpent-like movements and more so because people associate anything found in the water with Nessie, less resembles an taxidermic fever dream and more your traditional three-humped, larger-than-life water snake. Heck, in some instances, she even takes on the more familiar form of a plesiosaur. Often depicted as your typical dark green to shades of black in color, Pressy spans 75 feet in length with a long neck and a massive whale-like tail. And man, oh man, there are a ton of sightings. September 1984, the crew of two separate steamboats on their way to Copper Harbor witnessed a strange creature rising and falling in the water. The monster's back rose six to eight feet out of the water as it bobbed in and out. Both crews separately gave exacting accounts of what they both witnessed. July 1895, another steamboat crew reported an incident off the coast of Whitefish Point where they were tailed by a hideous creature that swam alongside them keeping pace with their vessel. The men reported its neck rose 15 foot from the water surface and had a jaw a foot wide. In 1933, two men were out fishing at Pictured Rocks in Munising, Michigan. As they sat there watching their lines, they observed a large, serpent-like creature bobbing across the surface of the water at an estimated nine miles per hour. As it passed, the monster created a strong wake. In the mid-1960s, a family was enjoying the day out near Sugar Island when they saw a massive creature swim through the water, slinking like an inchworm. They claimed the beast alternated between a bent, humped shape before straightening out long. They were unable to make out a head or tail. Summer of 1981, four siblings all observed a serpent-like creature bobbing in and out of the water. Three and then five humps broke the water's surface in alternating fashion. They remarked on how when the creature slowed down, the humps would rise higher out of the water, and when it would speed up, the humps would thin out. They said the creature came within about 20 yards of the beach they were relaxing at. The youngest of the siblings, still a child, ran away crying at the sight of it. In the mid-1990s, 
a fisherman told of how he watched in horror as a large creature rose to the water's surface where it stealthily snuck up on a duck, then bit down and dragged the waterfowl under, only leaving behind its severed head. As you can see, the list goes on and on and on. So maybe there is something out in these waters. Maybe the Michu Peshu exists. Or maybe it's a handful of different creatures altogether. Or maybe it's folklore and fallen logs. Either way, it's obvious Lake Superior is as mysterious as it is vast. Water has this way of fascinating us. It's vital yet lethal, beautiful and haunting, gentle and fierce. And like staring into a mirror or into the night sky, we can't help but feel a sense of wonder and mystery when we look across the water's glistening surface. It draws us in and at times to our own demise. And though our stories may change over time, the fact remains that so long as there are depths to explore, our curiosity will draw us there. If there were any such a thing as a lake monster, I'd place my bets here at Lake Superior. Skeptics and believers alike can both agree that from a strictly biological level, this lake has what it takes to house such a monster. And since we are here, let's take a look at one more Pressy sighting that might just be the most detailed account of all. On this Memorial Day, he was in for an experience he'd remember for the rest of his life. Randy Braun was out for a hike near Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park when he witnessed something off in the water alongside him. He snapped a photo and wrote down a vividly detailed and relatively long account of the sighting. So in spirit of authenticity, let's just read it directly so you can make of it what you want for yourself. On Memorial Day in 1977, I was out camping at Presque Isle Campground north of Ironwood, Michigan with a friend. I don't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday, but it was a beautiful morning and Lake Superior was like glass. Visibility was remarkable when looking out across the lake and distant land was visible. There's a trail that leads east from the campground which crosses the Presque Isle River that I was navigating. However, the bugs were unbearable. I headed north towards the lake hoping that walking along the beach would be more comfortable. When I reached the tree line, there was the beach, but about 100 feet below me. The slope leading to the beach was close to a 45 degree angle, with short dead trees protruding from the moss covered rock. And come to find out, also very slippery. It still amazes me to this day how I was able to control my slide and with a full backpack. I sheared off some of the scrub trees on the way down. Then again, I was young and experienced, having had extensive background in forestry and working in Idaho and Montana. I was 26 years old then. The beach was maybe 30 feet from the water's edge to the slippery slope and as I continued to walk east, sometimes no beach at all. Instead, there was water with tangled lake debris amid dead standing trees. The water was knee deep to waist deep, but difficult to get through. And as I think about it, I'm glad it wasn't lurking in there. After crossing through a couple of these beach barriers, it was clear beach as far as I could see, and I stopped by a 3 foot by 3 foot boulder, sat, and began to eat lunch. When I looked straight out to open water, I saw two very distinct dark bumps, which seemed to be separated by just a few feet. First, one bump would go under, and then the next bump would do the same, but only after the first one surfaced. I had a 20 times spotting scope with me and couldn't quite make out what they were. Then they began to move east and to my left, one bump going under and then the other, but one bump always staying on top of the water while the other submerged. It became frightfully apparent to me that this object was close to a thousand feet out, and as it gained speed I realized there was a third, smaller bump, and that the object was undulating. It moved very rapidly very rapidly to the east and quartered towards and nearly up to the shore. The now obviously living thing stopped maybe several hundred feet from me and began moving and weaving around large boulders that were in the water and directly towards me. It was big and resembled an anaconda with the girth of a Volkswagen. Don't laugh, it wasn't funny. There was nowhere to go for me because of the slippery slope and the water barriers, so I jumped behind the boulder and grabbed my 35mm Yashica. As it moved towards me, it slowed down considerably, 
but was making a noticeable wake. It was strangely quiet while it snaked toward me and stopped dead in the water right in front of me. It was big. I steadied my camera on top of the rock and fired one picture, but was afraid to move after that. The thing sat there for about 30 seconds with its huge horse-shaped head and large dark left eye staring at me. On the nose was a visible catfish type whisker, maybe two feet in length and wiggling. I don't talk to many people about it and have the original negative which I used to make an 8x10. The picture is pretty high quality and everything. It's quite a conversational piece. Incidentally, a Dr. Rains from the State University of New York in Plattsburgh has an 8x10 I've sent some 20 years ago. At the time of the incident, I lived in Northern Illinois, but now, ironically, I live in Michigan and only several miles from Lake Superior. I don't swim in any deep water lake anymore and occasionally have nightmares about being consumed by the thing I saw. Mishipishu, Pressy, the Lake Superior Monster, whatever you want to call it, there's no denying that people are seeing something out in this water. Maybe it's the sheer size of the lake and the whole thing's just throwing people off. Maybe it's just old tales and superstitions. Or maybe there really is something out in those copper-laden waterways and bluffs. And no matter which way you lean, there's simply no denying that the waters, like our own imaginations, are deep, dark, and beautiful mysteries worth exploring. Join us next time as we head to Japan, where inanimate objects left unattended might just take on a life of their own. If you love cryptids and want to learn even more about the creatures we just talked about, find us on TikTok or Instagram. Just search username at the cryptid atlas. By the way, the episode you just witnessed is both a podcast and YouTube video. So whichever format you prefer, we have you covered. Also, Check out our interactive cryptid map to browse the globe and learn about cryptids from your favorite areas. Every single episode we make adds another pin to our map. You can find our social channels, the map, and more at thecryptidatlas.com. And when you find us, be sure to tap that follow button and get in on the action by dropping a comment on our recent videos. If you enjoy this show, consider sharing it on with a friend. And if you listen on Apple or Spotify, consider leaving an honest review to help other listeners know what to expect. Thanks for touring cryptids across the Atlas. Until next time, keep your eyes open. You never know what you might see just on the edge of the road. And create it. Why my mouth is so dry. Lejeune. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, my throat is not having it today. <laughs> <laughs>